Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time and your word. I pray, Lord, that we would um, really be hit with uh, the truth of this passage. Um, God, it's easy to, to, to overlook certain passages and to go, oh, that's not me. Um, I have nowhere to, to grow there. But, but help us to really examine our hearts as we go through this uh, kind of communion text. In Jesus' name, amen. So the text um, is lengthy. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 through 34. I haven't done 17-ish verses in, in probably a year. But you guys know because we often do communion in the middle of this text. So you guys are pretty familiar but it's interesting when you, when you only ever hear the communion text, what comes before it? Because there's a lot of trouble, as you guys, if you've been here, have heard 1 Corinthians, the letter written to this church in Corinth, and several others likely in the area, but one specifically because Paul was, was being asked questions and writing the latter part of this letter to address concerns from the leadership. What should we do about this? What should we do about that? And so when we talked uh, months back about meat sacrifice to idols, being sensitive to other Christians, being sensitive to weaker brothers and sisters who are just that way or are brand new to the faith, whatever the case is, that our liberty shouldn't trump their uh, growth, that we shouldn't be like, well, you have to understand, you know, I enjoy this and it trips somebody up that is it really worth tripping up a brother and sister where the warnings in scripture tell you it is not worth doing that. If you know you're tripping somebody up, if you know you're doing something, um, I use the jokingly, the gambling, like if we were to be like, hey, you know what? We need to do windows. What? How could we raise some? Oh, let's do poker night, Friday night. And a couple guys come in. They're like, hey, we're brand new to Calvary Chapel. Uh, we just came from the Gamblers Anonymous meeting. And uh, well, what's going on here tonight? Is it Bible study? Oh, brother, Bible studies last night, but tonight, get ready. You guys probably know what's going on with 21. We're playing blackjack. You're going to trip people up, obviously. And I'm joking, clearly. We wouldn't do that. But, but even if some churches do, there are some churches that do things like this, that you're tripping people up and you're knowing that you're tripping them up, especially as they walk in from Gamblers Anonymous. So what we're talking about is the freedom that I enjoy, the freedom that you enjoy— let that be on to the Lord. Let that not be hurting another brother or sister. Now, if their gripe with you is something that's a legalistic point, that's a different issue. And to talk through that because we're not called to religion or legalism either. So Paul's talking in verse 17 about the conduct at what you and I would call potluck, communion, the meal that these people had. So a little bit of background, similar to a potluck in our day, they would eat, some would say, a weekly meal together. And that we do this kind of, um, some large churches just cannot possibly do this because of the, the sheer volume of people. But when when people are in a church where there's a potluck, or you're supposed to bring something, whatever that something is, you're supposed to bring uh, a meal to share. What some of these people were doing was Let's, and I'm, I'm just going to throw some crazy thing out there. Like I love prime rib. So let's say I, um, I'm not the pastor. I just attend the church. And I'm like, I'm bringing a prime rib. And I know these people over here, I love twice baked potatoes. So my friend over here is bringing twice pota baked potatoes. And some of the people that, that are newer to the church don't have any real, they have no means. They have no money. They can't, they can't afford to bring something that what was happening was these people would come early or on time and they would, they would put their meal down and then grab their plate. Like, now I'm first in line because, hey, excuse me real quick, the, the main course is coming. And then I slice myself a two-ounce or a two-pound piece of it, and I give my three or four friends that brought the sides that I like the rest of it. So halfway through, no one has any food. Halfway through, there's basically beans and bread left. Not that they're bad, but what, what happened to the main course? What happened to sharing? Well, you know, if you were to bring something, maybe you could be part of our little line. So out of order. So, I mean, I would even say hurtful. I would say um, brutal to uh, poor herb believers and people who in the church, um, maybe they've been there a while, but they don't have any means. He says in verse 17, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Where did I steal the title from? From, from Pastor Paul. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. 
For there must also be factions or divisions or issues among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. So there's a lot in this before we get to this this potluck thing. But the divisions, you and I live in a diverse culture, right? We live in a culture where there's everybody says, oh, we're divided. We're a divided nation. That's not news to anybody. Um, You want to get people angry. You want to get people arguing. It's almost as easy as breathing in the morning, okay? So we already know this. We expect this. But guys, divisions are not new. Um, Cultures and countries have been at war with one another and civil wars. There's 39 or 40 civil wars going on as we speak, if you look it up, depending on who what constitutes for some smaller countries an actual civil war. People fight. That's what they do. Little kids fight. That's what they do. It's the higher order. It's the Lord's love, the selfless, sacrificial love that we look to and we go, okay, I'm going to lay some of my preferences aside. I'm going to be the bigger person here. I'm going to take the quote high road. That's something the world is unable to do in, the mo- in most cases. Do you guys agree with that? I think so. I think it's obvious when you look out there. So, We expect divisions. We expect differing of opinions outside in a smaller church, whatever smaller is. Maybe the church is 100. Maybe it's 200. I don't know. But these these issues, these splits, these these, uh, uh, Apollos, Paul, Peter, oh, we only only read this guy. We don't really listen to you, Paul. You're not really full-time ministry to us, even though he started the church and he was there for a year and a half. And if anybody could say they were a full-time minister, it was Paul, even though he didn't ask for a salary, even though he, he, he made a living outside of, of uh, the church payroll. So in this case, people in this church are, are divided. They, they are, I wouldn't even say hate one another, but I would say it, it probably bordered on that. And he goes, I don't commend you on this. I hear about the divisions. I hear about the hatred. This is the church of God, guys. This is the assembly of the body of Christ. And what do we talk about when we talk about communion? The body of Christ. Who's taking it? What's the bread? What's the assembly, the ecclesia? What is it? It's a group of people gathered under one Lord. Now, the divisions, the preferences, how often do you do communion? What are the church uh, windows covered with? Uh, We have a a pulpit. You guys have a little table. Um, We do baptisms in the troughs outside. You guys built a huge baptismal. These are not important issues. These are not huge deals. Some people make them that way, but they're not huge deals. They're not scriptural issues. There's no command on how many gallons are in the baptism tank, believe it or not, in the New Testament, even though you'd look and see some of them have water slides and huge pools and stuff. So he says, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. So ultimately, the cream rises to the top. Ultimately, the truth rises. The leaders are shown approved in a fellowship and people who are divisive and people who are like uh, causing rifts and causing and gossiping and destroying the church and splitting it. Ultimately, those people will be out. I mean, it doesn't take long. Uh, the, the America is full of church splits and former church splits. I've been a part of churches that split into what they are. It's in, and not in Calvary Chapel. It's a lot rarer. It seems in Calvary Chapel in my experience in the last like 15, 20 years, but where I'm from, which is church, Central, uh, at one point in time, Wheaton, Illinois, was the largest amount of churches per square uh, mile in on the earth. So, I mean, there was more churches. There was 50 or something churches uh, in a tiny suburb uh, in, in Wheaton, Illinois, in the 80s and 90s. Tons of them split from other churches. And I went through it, and it's brutal. It is brutal to go through that stuff. Verse 20, he says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry, the other one's drunk. So that's what's going on here. So, okay, so we go back to first century. We go, okay, so you bring the Cabernet, and you bring the potatoes, and you bring the the cheesy uh, au gratin potatoes, and you bring the prime rib. And then anybody who doesn't bring anything, we'll let them go through. And if there's some au jus, they could drink off at the bottom. Great. So this guy's had five glasses of wine. This guy's eaten three pounds of prime rib. And at the end, these people are like, hey, where's the potluck? Oh, I guess there's nothing left but water. He's like, you guys, you got to be kidding me. This is what's going on in the church of God. This is what's going on at the quote, Lord's Supper. Now, another, another thing that you probably because of the, the culture you and I grew up in, we do communion, we put them in these plates, we pass them out, we go through the, the 
uh, song where we kind of like pray through and just set our hearts to receive it properly, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but these folks would eat that meal. And then at the very end of the meal, maybe sometimes informally grab some bread, grab a little bit of wine and say, we remember what the Lord did for us. And yet that's the only food some of these people even had. We always joke about like how much cracker we're giving you. To be honest with you, in Christ's day, the 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 cracker, if you will, wouldn't have been a whole lot bigger than what we give. Uh, unleavened, obviously, Passover celebration. That's how Jesus started it. So it wasn't like this big, puffy, uh, delicious French roll like we all love. Um, and I have been to churches before, way before COVID, where the elders of the church will stand there with a huge French loaf and you go up and grab it when you want to. And at this at this church, 1,500 people, 1,500 people. It was an old Home Depot, and you just grab the bread. A lot of people were like, huh, that's a little unsettling. This was the 90s, by the way. We don't do that, and that's not, I mean, it's. It, it, some people go, well, you shouldn't have bread that has yeast. It should be unleavened bread. Okay, I get that. That's, once again, one of these huge things where it's like, isn't it the heart of what you're doing? What kind of bread they had is kind of irrelevant. Um, but... In their day, at the end, it would be that. It would be, all right, guys, let's, let's you know, raise a toast or, or, or what have you. Let's remember what the Lord did. You're preaching and remembering what he did. Now, he'd, he'd only been gone a couple decades by then. And so they had learned that um, from Paul. But once again, what happens when, you guys have been there before. You've been to a cafeteria, like a, what are those places called? Like a country buffet or whatever. And they put out the steak. If you even get the steak, it's all hammered out and tenderized and whatnot anyway at those places. But you're like, I want some steak. And they put out like five or six steaks and the guy in front of you takes all of them. Your, your heart is pretty, you're kind of angry right now, right? That's how we're going to take communion? Like the people in the first three rows got all the food and the people in the last three or four rows got nothing. And it's like, great. Uh, this is all the bread I'll be eating today. Awesome. Thanks, Jesus. It, it not, it's not that their heart's awesome, but it's the people that were selfish ahead of time. It's like, guys, the heart of it all is, is to share. It's the commune idea the, that we have this meal in community, in common. So let's, if there's only enough prime rib for everybody to take like four ounces, let's do that. Let's not take two pounds and let uh, half the people not get anything. He goes, you, so one's hungry, one's drunk, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and, the sh and shame those who have nothing? Now, I've gone to many Peter Piper pizza parties before, okay? I'm just going to give you an example. Sometimes when people go, you're like, hey, is it an eating party? Like, is there pizza or is there this or is there hot dogs or whatever? Sometimes when I know that there's not going to be much, I eat beforehand. So I'm not tempted to take like four pieces of pizza. Now, I will confess, I have done this before. I have eaten more pizza than I should have eaten in front of my children. It's a horrible confession. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't mean to, and it wasn't like that was the last food in the place. Probably the only real good food in the place. But in that, it's like, guys, if you know that you're like famished, eat something at home before you get there. Don't assume it's going to be Thanksgiving when you show up to each and every potluck. We've had some great potlucks. We've had some medium potlucks. We've had some lean ones where not a lot of people showed up. And we always want to have enough. He says, um, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Is there anything worse than a brother or a sister who doesn't have much means and you shaming them? You don't have to say, did you bring anything? You don't have to say that to them. By, by like showing off your smoked prime rib and all the rest of it to somebody who walks in and they're like, we, me and my wife and my kid, we have nothing. We have no food. You shame them? This is, this is not the world. The world may not even do that with the food banks and stuff of these days. He goes, what? I mean, there's an exclamation point after that. I don't know what the translation is, but it's, it's like an emphatic, like, are you kidding me, you guys? this church. I started this church. He goes, you despise the church and shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Now there's a few places where he prayed it early on in, in chapter 11. He does commend them. There are other places where he commends the church. This 
there is shame here. It's, it's, it's food shaming, if you will. It's, guys, the conduct is horrible. You guys come together and you're not better for having met. You're worse off. What, how bad would it be for a church? You attend a church for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you're like, I've never grown. I'm worse off than when I showed up. That is a horrible thing to have been said. If nothing else, if you can't offer all these things, and nowadays we live in the entertainment era, so churches offer so much. I mean, churches have like 50, the big churches have like 50 ministries. Well, that's great. That's awesome. If you're able to do that, if you're able to staff that, that's awesome. And it's a wonderful thing. But if you can't do much, at least feed the people God's word. If nothing else, tell them, this is the authority of the universe, and we will bow down to it. We will put ourselves underneath it. So he says, and, and, I, and, and that's the preface to the, the passage that we always read, so we're not going to spend tons of time here. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed and took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So they had already eaten a meal. They were all together, all the 12 disciples. They're lounging on these pillows on a like like lounging back, sitting, very intimate, very awesome meal. And at the very, uh, like at the end of this meal, he tells them what's not only going to happen, but he tells them what the sign of the new covenant. These are symbols. I don't have time to get into tons. We'll get into it uh, just briefly about um, there's some, some of the communion theologies, if you will. But he says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When you do it, drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he preaches, till he comes. Uh, David Guzik says, you are preaching when you do this. Every one of you guys is preaching. You're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That the Lord's death is the covenant. Like without it, we're done. Like we're in trouble. That's what you're saying when you do it. So, um, this is uh, verses 27 through 34. The remainder of our passage is this idea of examining yourself, self-examination, how we come to the communion table. I will admit to you that after 40-something years of remembering church services, I've kind of moved a little bit, which scares me to say that to you guys out loud. Um, I've moved a little bit on this, and it was David Guzik who, and a few other commentators who kind of shifted my thinking on, on this passage because this is why context is everything. I didn't want to chop this up into one, two, or three, or two or three sermons, but one. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Every time I read that to you guys, I'm scared. It's a scary, scary thing. It's not a joke, and it's not something to ever be like, oh, yeah, you know, that doesn't apply to us or whatever. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And we'll get into the rest of it in a second, but this idea of self-examination. Now, lest you think that you're going to be able to do something, like you physically do something for the Lord to make yourself more worthy, that's a different, we're not talking about that. You can't make yourself more worthy to the Lord Jesus. Your worthiness is his blood. His blood is worthy. It's perfect. It's the sacrifice God required. When Barabbas, I love the, Mike Winger does a teaching on uh, like what Barabbas represents. Barabbas is this horrible, horrible guy. This hor- like he, There was three Roman crosses that day and Barabbas was let go and Jesus went up there and Barabbas was set free. That's me and you. Whether we've done whatever that guy did and it was bad for him to, I mean, they didn't just crucify anybody who jaywalked, trust me. It was a big deal. So it's, it's the blood of Christ that makes a person justified. But we have a responsibility to look at our heart the right way. We have a responsibility to look and say, am I in the right here? Am I in the wrong here? You have to understand, these people have just shamed Christians, brothers and sisters in the church. They have um, basically stood in line and taken all of the food slash good food and let some people in the fellowship go hungry. Hey, just fend for yourself. You know, well, maybe you should bring something. Wow. Like, what do you bring to the table? Well, I brought this. No, what do you bring to the salvation table? Nothing. 
You bring nothing. You brought a prime rib. Awesome. Good for you. You make more money than this guy. Awesome. Well, it's not even about that. You know, I just think more of the church. And so I give everything I could possibly give. That's why I, sh I brought this rib. I keep using prime rib because I want some right now. Um, you start talking about it and you're like, ah, it'd be a great thing today if I could find a way to cook that quick. You can't. But he says, um, you know, look at yourself. Look at your heart. You can't make yourself worthy. It's the way that they took communion. It's the way that they treated other brothers and sisters. Guys, we are called to a very high standard compared to the world. Would you agree that the world's standard for morality is super low? What they accept, the hypocrisy they are fine with, the world is fine with. They are fine with it. They are completely fine with it. They may fight for something and protest for something. And uh, the very, there was, I, I, I have to say this. I was watching this, this YouTube short where this girl is holding a Starbucks and she's attacking a conservative thinker. And she goes, you know, you're all about the billionaires and you're all about the whatever. And I would never buy something from Jeff Bezos and Amazon. He goes, you're drinking Howard Schultz's coffee. He's a billionaire. You think you, you think you don't get rich off a $4 cup of coffee? Come on, $5, six, 10, whatever. Dutch Brothers is 10. It's not coffee. It's a shake, but either way. It's a delicious one, by the way. Um, but pigging out and getting drunk and, and making other people like, like the idea that you would drink, like, I, I don't know how long, how, how different their wine was than ours, that you drink three, four, five, six glasses of wine right before the Lord's Supper. The idea that you would do that and be like, yeah, there's nothing left for the end. Maybe we could just use water or something. But you're fine with just taking communion. You're fine with going to the Lord and all of his selflessness. Because you guys, for this reason, many are weak and sick and die. Many sleep. As David Guzik puts it, a dirt nap. It was hilarious when he said that. Uh, the sermon that, he, that I listened to on, on him is literally like 40 years old. He's like, if you're hungry, go eat Taco Bell or go get a 29-cent hamburger. I'm like, bingo, 80s. There hasn't been anything since in 20 years, so I know how old the sermon was. But it's timeless. The principle is the same. Um, I love what David Lowry says about this. David Lowry, a great commentator on this specific letter. The Corinthians' despicable behavior at the communal meal was not without result, which Paul pointed out. Nowadays, when this passage is read before participation in the Lord's Supper, it is usually intended to produce soul-searching introspective and silent confession to Christ so that no one will sin against the spiritual presence of the Lord by irreverent observance. Now, that's where I come out on it. That's where I was, that's what I was taught. That's what I, I went to church and it was like, communion is hardcore and scary. And, you know, somebody that takes it the wrong way, bam, sleeping, meaning dead. I, I grew up with a lot of the kind of the fear of God preaching and the it, fear of God's not a bad thing. But if that's the only thing you have, you have one half of the, the righteous judge of the universe. That righteous judge made a way for people through grace and mercy. Nothing that you and I could ever do would deserve God's way in through his very own son. So obviously God is not just judgment. He is grace and truth through Christ. But that's where I was on it. Now, David Lowry says, Paul's application was probably more concrete. His body, the church, is also pictured by the bread of communion, thus to sin against another believer is to sin against the church, Christ. It's to sin against those guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord, um, those who despised a poorer member by disgracing their need, their poverty, their financial situation. Horrible. David Lowry, who's a lot smarter than me, is like, I think Paul's angling more at this. And, and it's not hard to get there. It's not hard to say, Hey guys, examine yourselves and because of how messed up your communion services are, it's not it's not a wonder why some of you guys are sick and and God's dealing with some of you. Also, you have to understand um the the, the idea of the apostolic gifts and you know are they still here? Are they all the same? I think it's quite clear when you read Acts that when you start something, there's a there's there's an underscoring of certain stuff. 
That's where I come out on Acts. That's the first book we did almost 10 years ago. And when you think about Peter and James and John and Paul, different giftings than today. Now, are all the spiritual gifts? Like, like would, you rem- would you say, you don't really see that today? No, I, I think the gifts that Paul talks about, which is next week, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, the gifts are out there. Do people get healed? Yes, absolutely they get healed. God heals. But I think he uses more of his spirit than a man or a woman. That's what I think. I'm not saying that there's no there's there's people uh, there's no one that has the gift of healing. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying when we read Acts, there is a there's a difference in those original twelve, incidentally that have actual thrones by Jesus in heaven. I think we're a little bit different, you and I, than than uh, Peter and James and John and the disciples. I think you and I are a little different than them. God uses people. I mean, I don't know how many people have Samson's strength today. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the closest we had in the mid eighties, but, um, not even close, but when you despise people, you're sinning against the body. When you, when a Christian who's been let out of hell despises somebody for being in need, that's a horrible thing. Not only is it a horrible thing, it's like hypocrisy tattooed. I mean, do we wonder why I'm not saying this church, I'm not saying I'm not calling out any church, but do we wonder why when some of this hypocrisy was huge, do we wonder why the world's like, man, I would never fit in a church like yours. I would never fit in an evangelical church. You have no idea what my pastor said when I was a little kid in the eighties or nineties or what my, I, I've seen, look, pastors are, are messed up people. Okay. They're, they're shepherds. They have a, they have a specific gift. Some of them teach, some of them don't. It's all over the board nowadays, the giftings of a pastoral staff. But what I will say is, have things been done horribly? Yes, because people have sinned. Absolutely. Luke 17, you know, there's temptations all over the place. There's, there's people struggling. First John says, if you say you don't have any, especially if you're a pastor and you say you don't have any, man, you're a liar. So sinful people will make mistakes. We talked about that last time we talked, even in the head coverings passage, that it's not about a man being better or a woman being this or that or the other thing. It's about different plan of God. That's what God, it's God's prerogative how he uses people. But the church had sickness and death because of how out of order they were. In communion, there's not a whole lot of things where God's like, I want you to do this and this and, and like 13 other things. And I want you to keep the law and I want you guys to, he's like, baptize believers and remember my death with a with an like a institution. Like, I want you to do this. I want you to have a, a service that commemorates, or I want you to have something that commemorates with these elements that show people what the elements were, what these two elements were, why they're necessary. And so if you can't get that one right, like, how do you get baptism wrong? I don't know. I don't know what they were doing with baptism, but communion, you're making these people that are coming to know Jesus Christ feel like they can't come. The last time Jesus encountered people who stepped in the way of people coming to God, he was throwing tables upside down with a currency exchange inside of the the temple. So when you stand in the way, God's going to deal. And maybe that's sickness. Maybe he uses, you know, like a sickness. Maybe he uses like, hey, man, like I'm really weak or I'm really do some self-examination. Figure out what's going on. Is there something that you're doing right now? that's hurting other believers. So he says in uh, verse 31, or if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Wait until everyone's there. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Paul was, I mean, he had, he had things to say to this church for sure. A couple things in closing. Make sure as you examine your own heart that you are growing. You're being made better because of where you fellowship. If you need to clear the air with somebody because it hinders your fellowship, do it honorably and do it with a spirit of humility. Do it with God's Holy Spirit according to how he would have you talk to that person. I find it when somebody confronts me and they do it humbly versus when someone comes at me and attacks me, 
I take those things very differently. <laughs> I think you probably do too. So, hey, can I, is there any way we could chat? Sure, yeah, what about? I just have this thing, maybe it's me. Maybe it's, maybe it's not right. Maybe I'm thinking something wrong. But when you said this a couple weeks back at church or whatever, I was like, man, is that what he thinks or is that what she thinks or whatever? Clear it. Don't try and take communion and only be thinking, oh, I'm so sick of that person. I hate that person. Like, how could you possibly get anything out of, out of communion when that's what's on your mind? I don't know. I couldn't. I'll just tell you that much. Secondly, when people are not growing, they can become legalistic, angry, weird, jaded, divisive, depressed, and so on. I have watched people over the years. I'm not, I've not been a pastor since the mid-80s, but my first um, church speaking gig, I was 19. I was a junior high intern, and I would speak here and there, but I would lead Bible studies, and I would watch the church staff. I would, wa- I would have to go to staff meetings, and, and there's 20 guys on staff at this, at the, I mean, pretty big church in Chicagoland, and you watch people. And you watch the interactions between the pastors and you watch the interaction between the elders and you watch like leaders in the church, lay leaders in the church. And you just watch people. You observe people. Over time, once in a while, I go, hey, whatever happened to so-and-so? Oh yeah, he didn't go to church anymore. Are you kidding me? That guy was like the most hardcore guy ever. Yeah, I don't know. He got mad at somebody or somebody said something to him or whatever. May we never have the type of heart that somebody saying something truly mean, and that is on them if they do, literally stops us from going to church. Now, if you need to go to a different church, God bless. Great. Like, if you're going to this place and it's like all dead ends and God's like, hey, that is is not where I want you. I want you over here. Maybe he puts some roadblocks there and he wants you over here. Great. But make sure where you go, you're moving forward. Because when you get older and when you get 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I've seen this a lot more than in young people. People get older. I was talking to a guy at a store last week. This exact same thing happened. I go, hey, where are you going? You're not going anywhere right now. Oh, okay. Tell me about that. Is that okay? Hey, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Okay. I mean, when someone's like that, like mad and harsh and whatnot, not the time at, at a store uh, necessarily to be like, Hey, let's talk about all of the issues right now. But to be somebody who's like, Hey, I'm, I'm here for you. You want to talk? I'm here for you. I'm not your pastor, but we're friends. Let's, let's just talk. So when you're not growing and when you're maybe in a bad spot, then somebody says something, then somebody takes your prime rib or your Texas rolls in my case. And, and it, and you, you, you wonder like how far, how fast did I fall? How fast did I get away from like, just like, I'm blown away nowadays at how many ministries are out there. Okay. There's, there's 8 million teachings on YouTube from different people. There's 8 million parachurch organization ministries. There's this one and this, this prison ministry, this one, this halfway house. I mean, I can't keep it straight. People ask me regularly, what do you think of this ministry? I'm like, I don't know anything about it. I don't know nothing. This happens all the time. Thank you, John. It did happen with us. I know it was a good thing. It was a good thing. But I was talking to somebody recently and they said this, this person got into this. And this is within a church that you guys know of, not in this town, but a church, a Calvary Chapel church. And he goes, yeah, so this guy got into this ministry. He went to this thing and the next thing you know, this is the most important ministry on the earth and we can't live without it and it's changed my life. And after 20 years in the church or however long under this really solid teacher, he's like, he's mad at me because I don't endorse this parachurch ministry. He's mad at me. Well, isn't the, it the pastor's prerogative if he listens to what they say and goes, hey, this is some good stuff. It's not the Bible. Your parachurch organization ain't the Bible. I don't care who you are. If you started something, awesome. Let it be a work of the Holy Spirit and let God look at uh, Samaritan's Purse. <clears throat> God, I think it's obvious God's blessed that. I think it's obvious OCC blesses lots of children. That is not, we don't do that in lieu of meeting on Sunday morning. We don't pack boxes in lieu of ever meeting again or having communion or having a communal meal like we do monthly. No, <clears throat> it's a wonderful auxiliary. It's a wonderful in addition to. 
It is not the word of God. No matter what you're into, no matter what ministry you love, no matter your favorite guy, no matter your favorite, whoever, whoever that is, none of them are on par. I don't care who they are. They are not on par with a, a teaching body that regularly gives you God's word and where you know the spirit of God is teaching you through this word being read out loud. I could just read this to you guys. We'd be out of here in five minutes. Um, but at the same time, some of those ministries are wonderful. Some of those ministries really, really help people. I've been really helped by Abiding Life Ministries. I've been really, really helped by that. But it is not on par. And I, I know the people behind it. They're, they're great guys. They're very flawed, just like me, just like every pastor that's ever lived. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. So I know every pastor's flawed because he's the chief of sinners. And I think the rest of us are underneath him. I don't know. It's a crazy thought. <clears throat> so we're all the chief of sinners. But at the same time, the ministries are like, if it's blessing you, that doesn't mean that this guy over here has to adopt it the same way you did. He doesn't have to be like, oh, you don't love X, Y, Christ ministries? Oh, well, then you're a heretic. Wait, what? What are you talking about? They just started five minutes ago. Jesus wrote this stuff a long time ago. And the words never changed. When people are not growing, they become legalistic, angry, weird, jaded. They start believing crazy stuff. They start like, oh, yeah, I don't know if I even, I, I was doing a funeral once, and this guy from a solid church, solid Bible teaching church, literally right before me goes, it was a funeral, and he goes, yeah, who knows what really happens after we die? Where do we even go and stuff? I'm like, wow, is it that hard to just, if, if you're going to say something like that, just read a Bible verse and sit down, honestly. Read a comforting Bible verse and sit down. I'm sorry. It was brutal. I had to go up and follow that guy, and it was brutal. I mean, it just rebutted every single thing that he said at a funeral. It was, it was not fun. Um, they almost never are, by the way. But I've seen people over the years attend a Christian church only to be offended and simply not fellowshipping with a church anymore. Just like that. We live in a divisive world and a divisive culture. We do not need the hand of the enemy for any extra help. We got enough of we got enough trouble out there. We the church need to be a unified body in the days of the division which we live in. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. And uh, God, how week by week you show us something different. You show us, um, God, maybe someplace where we need to fix, maybe someplace where we need to um, allow for more grace. Um, God, I do pray that we're a church that, that doesn't hinder people from coming to, to know who you are, the Savior of the world. God, we believe that and we love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.